Hello, dear listeners, and welcome back to the Diplomacy and Discourse podcast. I'm your host, MR, and I'm truly delighted to have you with us for this riveting discussion. Your continued support means the world to us, and I want to express my sincere appreciation for your presence here today. Before we delve into the captivating narrative that lies ahead, I'd like to encourage you to actively participate in our podcast journey. If you found value in our content, consider leaving a review on your preferred podcast platform or giving this video a thumbs up if you're joining us on YouTube. These small gestures go a long way in helping us grow and connect with more curious minds like yours. For those of you who wish to share their thoughts, questions, or suggestions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at diplomacyanddiscourse at gmail.com. Your insights are invaluable and they shape the direction of our podcast. Once again, I extend my heartfelt gratitude to your unwavering support. Now, let's immerse ourselves in the enthralling narrative of today's episode. Thank you for being an integral part of our community, and let's embark on this intellectual journey together. Picture this, a world teetering on the precipice of profound change where the class of civilization looms as a formidable specter. It is a narrative that weaves its way through the intricate fabric of international relations, one that I find both captivating yet unsettling. The theory in question, put forth by the esteemed political scientist Samuel P. Huntington, posits that the cultural and religious identities will emerge as the primary source of conflict in a post-Cold War world. Huntington first published his Class of Civilizations Theory in 1993, and his book, quote, The Clash of Civilization and the Remaking of World Order, end quote, was published in 1996. The theory is controversial because it suggests that the world is divided into distinct cultural and religious groups that are in constant conflict with each other, which some have seen as a way of legitimizing prejudice and stereotypes. As I pondered the implications of Huntington's theory, the obvious questions came to mind. Could this be the world of the future? What would it be like to live in a world where conflict is based on cultural and religious identities? How could this affect the way we interact with each other? What kind of impact would this have on international relations? These were all questions that swirled in my head as I considered the implications of this idea. I could only hope that something would be done to prevent this bleak future from becoming a reality. Well, let's dissect this theory in the context of today's global landscape. Huntington's assertion that the widespread Western belief in universal values and political systems is too sincere in the contemporary political arena. This claim is that we find ourselves amidst a shifting balance of economic, military, and political power with the West no longer holding an unassailable dominance. This shift has been caused by a variety of factors, including the rise of new economic powerhouses in the East the resurgence of old powers like Russia and China, and the restructuring of the global economy. This has created a new era of uncertainty, with the potential for conflict as different nations vie for power and influence. Two formidable civilizations, China and Islam, emerge as the key players on this geopolitical chessboard. China an ancient civilization, yearns to reclaim its regional hegemony, presenting a substantial challenge to Western interests. China's growing economic and military might, coupled with its strategic ambitions, make it a formidable competitor. Additionally, the rise of Islamic nations in the Middle East has further complicated the situation as China seeks to expand its influence in the region. The clash between Chinese cultural aspirations and America's desire for a hegemony-free Asia underscores the gravity of this dynamic. 
Meanwhile, the Islamic civilization grapples with the population explosion, breeding instability both within its borders and its peripheries. Fundamentalist movements gained traction as witnessed in events like the 1979 Iranian Revolution, the Gulf War, and the invasion of Iraq. Huntington's provocative claim that Islam has a quote-unquote bloody borders reverberates with a somber resonance as conflicts between Islamic and non-Islamic civilizations persist. However, contrary to Huntington's assertion, the cultural global landscape is characterized by a wave of globalization that has brought people, cultures, and nations together. Economic interdependence and technological advancements have enabled the formation of transnational networks, which have created new opportunities for dialogue and collaboration. This has led to a more unified world, with nations recognizing the need for collective solutions to global issues. It is these new realities that are said to challenge the traditional West-centric view of the world paving the way for a more equitable and just world order. However, we must pause to scrutinize the terminology here. Is it valid to speak of an Islamic civilization? The very concept raises questions about its foundation, borders, language, capital, culture, and people. Can a civilization truly be defined by religious beliefs? especially when historical records attest to the fluid nature of human beliefs. The modern states governed by fundamentalist interpretations of Islam may provide a lens into this conundrum. But what about the assertion of Islamic rage? Why does it seem that only Muslims are associated with such fervor? A litany of incidents of various acts of terrorism worldwide leaves us pondering the motivations and grievances at play. Amidst all this, the rising prominence of China, a civilization in its own right, challenges Huntington's conclusions. China's practical approach to social, economic, and military evolution seems to defy the clash of civilizations theory. However, questions remain about how Islam views China, given their differing beliefs. In essence, we find ourselves in a world where it's not merely a clash of civilizations, but rather a collision of religious beliefs. Is a clash between Islam and the West inevitable? Some say yes. Recent intelligence estimates indicating growing Muslim discontent with American policies potentially leading to violence. Yet the very notion of safety in this context raises complex questions. Take Denmark for instance. A nation with a multicultural, open-hearted society that finds itself under attack due to a seemingly innocuous publication. The incident is the publication of cartoons depicting the Prophet Muhammad in a Danish newspaper back in 2005. This caused outrage among Muslims around the world and led to protests and attacks on embassies and other buildings. This incident highlighted the tension between the Islamic and Western worlds and raised questions of religious tolerance and free speech. It serves as a stark reminder that avoiding enmity under these conditions may demand sacrifices that fundamentally alter the essence of a society. So, as we navigate the labyrinthine currents of global geopolitics, it's apparent that many are searching for a paradigm, a conceptual framework to comprehend and, dare I say, control the complex dynamics at play. Samuel Huntington's notion of the clash of civilizations has gained prominence, positing that the world is witnessing a clash between Islam and the West, among other cultural conflicts. But, as in any quest for truth, we must begin with a critical examination of the facts. Is it genuinely the case that ethnic conflicts are on the rise compared to two decades ago? The answer is not as straightforward as it may seem. Many of the major conflicts, like those in Burundi and Rwanda, had their roots deeply entrenched even during the Cold War era. 
The conflicts were often driven by deep-seated political, economic, and social grievances that had been brewing for decades and were largely ignored by the international community. With the end of the Cold War, these grievances were exacerbated by the lack of international intervention, leading to increased tensions and conflicts. While some later conflicts did emerge within the former Soviet system, such as in Yugoslavia, history reveals that the breakdown of tyrannical systems often led to internal strife, a pattern observed during the collapse of European empires. Now, let's scrutinize the class of civilization's theory itself. Huntington's assertion that Islam is pitted against the West encounters some thorny issues. For example, he fails to consider the facts that many Muslims are progressive and believe in democracy. In addition, the Islamic culture has had a long history of coexisting within other cultures. He also fails to acknowledge that the class of civilization is more likely to be between radical Islam and the West rather than between Islam and the West as a whole. Saudi Arabia, a nation known for its fundamentalist Islamic ideology, stands as one of the United States' closest allies. So this paradoxical alliance raises questions about the purported clash between civilizations. The reality is that Saudi Arabia's significance in terms of oil reserves and geopolitics overshadows ideological differences. Moreover, Huntington's theory does not take into account the growing interconnectedness between Islamic and Western societies. Trade, travel, and other forms of communication have become increasingly prevalent, and this has created a more tolerant and accepting relationship between the two. This has also resulted in the emergence of a younger generation that is more open-minded and liberal. This shift in attitudes is likely to lead to greater cooperation and mutual understanding between the two parties and will eventually bridge the ideological divide. Nonetheless, on a smaller scale, non-state actors have wrecked havoc in countries like Afghanistan. This includes perpetrating acts of terrorism, engaging in armed conflict, and perpetrating human rights abuses. These acts of violence have resulted in the displacement of millions of civilians, an increase in poverty and deprivation, and a deterioration of security across the country. It's worth noting that these extremist groups derive their power from financial aid with billions flowing from the pockets of the American people. Younger Muslims are more liberal and democratic, but radicalism still persists. Huntington's theory does not account for the paradoxical alliance between the US and Saudi Arabia, which is an example of how geopolitics can override ideological differences. The reality is that non-state actors have used violence to further their ideological agenda in areas such as Afghanistan. This proves that clashes between civilizations can still occur even though younger Muslims may be more open-minded and liberal. However, attributing the turmoil in Afghanistan solely to the actions of the US and the West is overly simplistic. So where does the clash of civilizations between Islam and the West truly manifest? Consider Indonesia. An Islamic State? Do we witness concerted efforts by the United States to undermine Indonesia despite issues like low wages or their ban on LGBTQ expressions? The answer is a resounding no. It becomes evident that the Clash of Civilizations narrative may be a facade driven by the need for evolving paradigms that can shape careers and foster control. This paradigm has been used to justify military interventions and wars, as well as attempts to control the flow of information. But as a result, this narrative has been used to further the agenda of certain political groups instead of promoting peace and understanding. As we probe deeper, we confront the historical support of radical Islam by the United States and Britain a practice aimed at countering the perceived threat of secular nationalism. Washington and London have had a long history of supporting radical Islam, 
seeing it as a way to counter secular movements in the region. This support has included providing financial aid, military training, and even weaponry to certain groups, as well as helping to create and support extremist organizations. This historical perspective contextualizes contemporary events, such as the Arab Spring, where the U.S. supported regimes in Saudi Arabia and in Kuwait while suppressing uprisings in other regions. It is paradoxical because the West has traditionally supported liberal movements, yet at the same time has been willing to work with and support regimes that oppose such movements for their own geopolitical interests. Now, let's fast forward and contemplate the future. Are we heading towards parallel blocks existing side by side in passive coexistence? It is possible that there will be two parallel blocks in the future, each with its own set of values and interests. This could be a result of the current state of globalization, where countries are increasingly interconnected and interdependent, and countries are more likely to form alliances and agreements with other countries that share their interests. The Western Hemisphere, with the U.S. at the helm, exerts its influence, while Central and South America operate without a dominant player fostering regional unity through organizations like CELAC, C-E-L-A-C, which stands for the Community of Latin American and Caribbean States. It is an intergovernmental organization formed in 2010 to promote regional integration and cooperation. It was formed in response to the growing need for increased cooperation and collaboration between Latin American and Caribbean countries to address common issues and challenges. The U.S. has supported the organization, seeing it as a way to increase cooperation and collaboration among Latin American and Caribbean countries. CELAC is actively engaged in a variety of activities, such as promoting economic development, strengthening international security and stability, and protecting the environment. Across the Atlantic, the rise of Islam is undeniable. This religious movement spans from Casablanca in Africa, weaving through islands and reaching as far as the Philippines, forming an expansive presence in the heart of the world. This expansion has been driven by a variety of factors, including immigration, conversion, and missionary work. Islam is a fast-growing religion in many parts of the world, and its presence is becoming increasingly visible. This evolution suggests a potential transformation from a Christian era to an Islamic one, mirroring historical shifts. But here's the intriguing part. Could we witness a synthesis of Christianity and Islam? A Chrislam, if you would given their striking similarities. Both religions share commonalities, with the key distinction lying in the divine character of Christ in Christianity and the prophetic role of Muhammad in Islam. Realistically, it is unlikely that Chrislam will transpire as there are many differences between Christianity and Islam that would be difficult to reconcile. For example, Christianity has a Trinitarian view of God, while Islam has a monotheistic view and the two religions also have different approaches to salvation and the afterlife. Additionally, the two religions have starkly different views on the role of women in society. Thus, while it is possible to find common ground between the two religions, it is unlikely that a synthesis of the two will occur. In the evolving narrative of global dynamics, it's essential to peel back the layers of complexity question prevailing paradigms and remain open to the possibility of a future shaped by convergence rather than confrontation. The world is a vast and ever-evolving tapestry, and it's our duty as thinkers and analysts to unravel its intricacies. So, as we delve further into the intricacies of global dynamics, the question that looms large is whether this process of synthesis, this blending of cultures, will unfold peacefully or take a path fraught with violence. Recent events 
involving Iran and President Erdogan's assertive moves in the eastern Mediterranean and North Africa include troop deployments to Libya, raise concerns about the potential for violence in this transformation. It's entirely possible that we are witnessing the initial steerings of a tumultuous era. President Erdogan has long sought to restore the Ottoman Empire, which existed until the early 20th century. He has invoked the legacy of the empire in his speeches and has made clear his desire to expand Turkey's influence in the region. To this end, he has pursued a strategy of military intervention and diplomacy in the eastern Mediterranean and in North Africa, including the aforementioned deployment to Libya, signing maritime agreements with Libya, and engaging in numerous political and economic initiatives. Libya is a significant country in the eastern Mediterranean, as it is a major transit route for oil and gas. Its strategic location provides access to the Mediterranean Sea and the Suez Canal, making it a gateway to Africa and beyond. President Erdogan's political deals with Libya provide Turkey with a foothold in the region and influence in regional politics. This is important as it will enable Turkey to gain leverage in negotiations over the distribution of resources and the establishment of trading routes. Erdogan's vision of restoring the Ottoman Empire is a major factor in the geopolitical tensions in the region and it is likely to have a significant impact on the future course of global dynamics. Restoring the Ottoman Empire is a major factor in the geopolitical tensions in the region due to the fact that it was one of the most powerful empires in the world and its legacy is still remembered by many. Erdogan's desire to revive the empire has caused political tensions with other nations in the region over access to resources and strategic routes. This has led to an increased risk of conflict between nations, as well as a clash between different civilizations. Erdogan's ambitions to expand Turkey's influence in the region are seen as a challenge to the existing power structures and could potentially lead to further destabilization. So this could have a significant impact on the future course of global politics. Now, where do the behemoths of Eurasia, China and Russia fit into this evolving landscape? As some scholars assert that the United States appears to decline both China and Russia are ascendants in various ways. However, realistically speaking, US influence is not on the decline. While the United States faces various domestic and international challenges, it is still considered a superpower and has significant global influence. The US is still a major economic and military power and has strong diplomatic ties with many countries around the world. Additionally, the U.S. has a number of international agreements and commitments, such as NATO and other alliances, that demonstrate its influence and impact on global affairs. Consider China's growing influence in Iraq, though, where it has assumed a pivotal role in the region's security dynamics. China's growing influence in Iraq is due to its military and economic strength. China has become a major arms supplier to Iraq and has been investing heavily in the country's infrastructure and energy sectors. This has allowed China to become a major player in the region's security dynamics. The vacuum left by the US is already being filled by these giants. China has also played a key role in brokering a deal between Iran and Saudi Arabia that allowed both countries to open embassies in each other's countries. This agreement has been seen as a major breakthrough in the relationship between the two countries and could potentially lead to further peace and stability in the region. The agreement could pave the way for closer economic ties between Iran and Saudi Arabia, which could have a positive impact on the region's economy and potentially lead to increased trade and investment. It could also lead to an increased level of cooperation between the two countries on issues such as counterterrorism, which could have a positive impact on global security. The COVID-19 pandemic has further underscored this shift by highlighting the importance of China and Russia's international role. During the pandemic, China and Russia have provided vital assistance to many countries, including medical supplies and personnel. 
This has allowed them to gain influence and goodwill in many countries, which could lead to increased diplomatic ties and economic opportunities in the future. Additionally, it has highlighted the importance of Russia and China's role in global affairs, as both countries have been able to provide assistance to countries in need. The Trump administration's actions, including the withdrawal of a significant portion of U.S. troops from Iraq, signal a stance that implies we have done what we could, and if you don't appreciate our efforts, we'll withdraw, leaving you to grapple with the consequences. This hints at the possibility of escalating violence in the regions left to their own devices. As the internal landscape has shifted over the past few years, some groups have become more influential. The Jewish community is one of these groups, many of whose members' concerns have global implications. The Jewish community has been particularly influential in advocating for human rights, fighting anti-Semitism, and promoting peace and security. They also play an important role in the global economy, with many of its members being entrepreneurs and investors. A community that is highly organized and financially and politically powerful can provide policymakers with a great deal of influence over the opinions and policies of world leaders. They are also able to use their networks to further their goals and objectives. The United States protects Israel, a country whose people are a part of the Jewish community. The Jewish community can also influence U.S. foreign policy through its large financial and political networks and connections with powerful politicians. This gives them a level of influence that other countries may not have and allows them to use their influence to protect Israel's interests. Despite their influence, it is imperative to remember that no one group controls the world, and I completely condemn anti-Semitism, and Islamophobia. This is just to show that eligible groups today can hold significant sway in shaping global events, and their influence is set to dominate in the coming years. Now, when we turn our gaze towards Asia, which country should command our attention? The complexities of the region encompass issues like Kashmir, the South China Sea, and North Korea. However, it appears that Iran is poised to play a pivotal role. But why is Iran of such significance? Despite the region being dubbed, quote-unquote, the Fertile Crescent, Iran stands out as remarkably green and fertile, particularly in comparison to its drought-stricken neighbors. This, coupled with its abundant natural resources, positions Iran for long-term advantage. Meanwhile, Iraq, situated within this fertile crescent, boasts efficient use of the Euphrates and Tigris rivers, potentially enabling it to endure and triumph in the attrition of regional conflicts. However, the Euphrates River is currently being dried up due to the issues in Syria and Turkey, both of which are upstream of Iraq. This has serious implications for Iraq's potential to survive and thrive in the midst of regional conflicts. Furthermore, Iran is currently facing a number of human rights issues and other governmental issues that must be addressed before it can stand out and utilize its natural resources efficiently. As we navigate these shifts, economic stability remains a crucial consideration. The United States finds itself in a precarious financial situation, with debts exceeding its financial resources. This debt has been accumulated due to a variety of factors, including tax cuts, increased military spending, and entitlement programs, and if it's not managed carefully, it could lead to economic instability and a recession. While this may seem unsustainable, it is bolstered by the need to repay the economic relief packages distributed to businesses and civilians. Currently, the U.S. is close to the point where it no longer has money to fund its government. Congress did, however, pass the necessary legislation and avoided a government shutdown, which would affect various government services. A government shutdown 
would have forced federal employees to go without pay. The situation has become dire due to the political gridlock and the refusal of some Republicans to support the legislation needed to fund the government. A government shutdown occurs when Congress fails to pass a budget or the funding of government operations. It can result in the suspension of various government functions, including federal agencies and services. Yet, our focus should extend beyond individual nations to the concept of Eurasia, a vast expanse bridging China and Europe. This notion of Eurasia is gaining traction, primarily driven by China and Russia. Central Asia holds strategic importance for several superpowers due to various factors. Firstly, its geographical location makes it a crucial crossroad between Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. This positioning grants access to important trade routes and transportation networks, including the ancient Silk Road. Additionally, Central Asia is rich in natural resources, particularly in oil, gas, and minerals. Superpowers seek to secure access to these resources to fuel their economies and maintain energy security. Central Asian countries like Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan poses significant reserves, making them attractive partners for energy-hungry nations. Furthermore, Central Asia shares borders with volatile regions, such as Afghanistan and China's Xinjiang province, which have ongoing security concerns. Superpowers are interested in ensuring stability in Central Asia to prevent the spread of extremism, terrorism, or regional conflicts that could have global repercussions. Lastly, Central Asia presents opportunities for geopolitical influence and competition among superpowers. For example, Russia views Central Asia as its traditional sphere of influence and seeks to maintain close ties with countries in the region. On the other hand, China's Belt and Road Initiative aims to enhance its economic connectivity with Central Asia and expand its influence in the region. The Belt and Road Initiative, its acronyms are BRI, also known as One Belt, One Road. It's a massive infrastructure and development project launched by China in 2013. It aims to enhance connectivity and promote economic cooperation between China and countries in Asia, Europe, Africa, and beyond. The initiative consists of two main components, the Silk Road Economic Belt, and the 21st century maritime Silk Road. In Central Asia, China is actively involved in multiple areas. Firstly, it invests heavily in infrastructure projects such as roads, railways, ports, and energy pipelines. These projects aim to improve connectivity within the region and facilitate trade between China and Central Asian countries. For example, the china kyrgyzstan uzbekistan Railway and the China-Kazakhstan oil pipeline are significant projects under the Belt and Road Initiative. China is also expanding its economic presence in Central Asia through trade and investment. It seeks to establish stronger economic ties by increasing bilateral trade, setting up special economic zones, and promoting industrial cooperation. Additionally, China invests in sectors such as energy, mining, agriculture, and manufacturing in Central Asian countries. Furthermore, China is actively engaged in cultural and educational exchanges with Central Asian nations. It promotes people-to-people -people connectivity through initiatives like student exchanges, scholarships, and cultural events. This cultural diplomacy aims to foster mutual understanding and strengthen cultural ties between China and Central Asian communities. Overall, China's activities in Central Asia through the Belt and Road Initiative encompasses infrastructure development, economic cooperation, cultural exchanges, and increased connectivity. These efforts are part of China's broader strategy to enhance its regional influence and secure its economic interests. These two powers are crafting a Eurasian Union a construct akin to the European Union 
but on a grander scale. Russia and China have indeed showed interests in establishing closer ties and cooperation within the Eurasian region. The concept of a Eurasian Union has been discussed and pursued to varying degrees by both countries. However, it is important to note that the specific nature and scope of such a union, as well as its potential members, are still subject to ongoing negotiations and geopolitical dynamics. A Eurasian Union would likely enhance economic integration and cooperation within the region, promote trade, and increase political influence. The exact goals and objectives would depend on the specific arrangements and agreements made by the participating countries. Whether the Eurasian Union would be seen as a threat to the United States or beneficial to the Middle East largely hinges on the perspective and interests of different countries. The United States may perceive it as a challenge to its influence in the region, while some Middle Eastern countries may view it as an opportunity for closer economic ties and regional stability. The impact on the Middle East would largely depend on how the Eurasian Union interacts with existing regional dynamics and the specific policies it adopts. In terms of geostrategic importance, an Eurasian Union could potentially counterbalance other global powers, such as the United States or the European Union. It could also enhance connectivity and cooperation between Europe and Asia opening up a new economic opportunities and promoting regional stability. As for the connection to the clash of civilizations theory, it should be remembered that this theory suggests that future conflicts will primarily occur along cultural and civilizational fault lines, while the Eurasian Union could potentially bring together countries with different cultural and civilizational backgrounds, its establishment and objectives are driven more by geopolitical and economic considerations rather than by a direct manifestation of the class of civilizations theory. Furthermore, this influence extends across the Atlantic, with China's economic reach penetrating into Latin America, particularly in countries like Uruguay, Paraguay, Brazil, and Argentina. China has been actively increasing its presence and influence in South America in recent years. Whether China's influence in the region can be considered successful or not depends on various factors and perspectives. One reason why China is expanding its influence in South America is its growing economic engagement. China has become a major trading partner for many South American countries, importing commodities such as soybean, oil, and minerals, and exporting manufactured goods. Chinese investments in the infrastructure, energy, and agriculture sectors have also increased, stimulating economic growth in several countries. This economic cooperation has strengthened China's ties and influence in the region. Moreover, China has pursued diplomatic initiatives to enhance its presence. It has engaged in high-level visits, signed numerous bilateral agreements, and established various cooperation mechanisms. China's participation in regional organizations, such as the Community of Latin American and Caribbean States, CELAC, and the Forum of China and the Community of Latin American and Caribbean States, China CELAC Forum, has provided platforms for dialogue and cooperation, further expanding its influence. However, there are challenges and limitations to China's influence in South America. One concern is the potential for economic dependency on China. Some argue that the heavy reliance on Chinese demand for commodities could leave South American countries vulnerable to economic fluctuations and price volatility. There are also concerns about the environmental and social impacts of Chinese investments in sectors such as mining and infrastructure. Furthermore, China's expanding influence has raised questions about its intentions and the potential for geopolitical competition with other global powers, particularly the United States. 
The region's historical ties with the U.S. and its alignments with Western institutions may create challenges for China's efforts to increase its influence. Plenty of scholars have agreed that China has been successful in expanding its influence in South America through economic cooperation, diplomatic initiatives, and increased trade and investment. However, the impact and sustainability of China's influence in the region depends on various factors, including economic dependencies, environmental concerns, and geopolitical dynamics. China's efforts to gain influence around the world have indeed raised questions about its competition with the United States. While it is challenging to make a definitive statement about whether China is falling behind the U.S. in terms of influence, there are several factors to consider. In terms of economic influence, China has made significant strides in recent years. It has become the world's second largest economy and expanded trade and investment globally. China's Belt and Road Initiative, for example, aims to enhance connectivity and infrastructure across Asia, Europe, and Africa, contributing to its influence in these regions. However, the United States remains a dominant economic power and continues to exert considerable influence through its trade relationships, multinational corporations, and financial institutions. In terms of military influence, the United States remains the world's most powerful military force, with a global network of military alliances and bases. China, on the other hand, has been modernizing its military capabilities and expanding its presence in the South China Sea and the Indian Ocean region. While China's military influence is growing, it still lags behind the United States in terms of global reach and capabilities. In terms of soft power and cultural influence, the United States has traditionally held a significant advantage. With its influential entertainment industry, academic institutions, and English language dominance, however, China has been investing in cultural initiatives such as the Confucius Institutes, promoting Chinese language learning, and expanding its media presence, aiming to enhance its soft power worldwide. It remains to be seen how successful China will be. At challenging the United States' cultural influence, it is important to note that influence is a complex and multifaceted concept, encompassing various dimensions such as economic, military, and soft power. Both China and the United States engage in active competition to expand their influence globally. While China has made significant progress in recent years, the United States. Will and still retain substantial influence across many regions and sectors. The dynamic nature of global politics and changing power dynamics make it difficult to determine a clear winner or loser in the competition for influence. Looking ahead, we might find ourselves in a world that bears some resemblance to what has occurred from 2015 to the present. Even into 2015, the key difference could be the emergence of civilizational regional systems, such as the Eurasian Union, Mercosur, Unasur, and the African Union. These entities may shape the trajectory of our world, leading to a super civilization, a concept yet to be fully defined. The question lingers: Is this transition the culmination of history? ECOWAS, E C O W A S, which stands for the Economic Community of West African States. It was formed with the aim of promoting regional integration, economic cooperation, and stability among its African states. It was established in 1975 to address the common challenges faced by West African countries and enhance their collective bargaining power on the global stage. ECOWAS was formed by several factors. Firstly, the member states recognized the importance of regional cooperation to foster economic development and improve living standards by creating a unified market 
facilitating trade and harmonizing policies, ECOWAS aims to promote economic growth and attract investment to the region. Secondly, ECOWAS seeks to address security concerns and promote political stability in West Africa. By fostering peaceful relations among its member states and facilitating conflict resolutions, ECOWAS aims to prevent armed conflict and military interventions within the region. In terms of geopolitical and geostrategic importance, West Africa is strategically positioned with access to the Atlantic Ocean, valuable natural resources, and potential trade routes. The region's stability and economic growth have implications not only for its member states, but also for neighboring regions and international partners. ECOWAS plays a crucial role in maintaining regional stability and fostering economic cooperation, which in turn attracts investments and ensures a favorable business environment. Regarding the military coups happening in Niger, Guinea, Burkina Faso, and Mali, these events pose challenges to the stability and governance of these countries. ECOWAS has consistently condemned military coups and unconstitutional changes of government as they undermine democratic processes and can lead to political instability. ECOWAS has taken measures to address these coups, such as imposing sanctions, diplomatic pressure, and promoting dialogue to restore constitutional order. While military coups are a concern for ECOWAS, it is important to note that the organization has handled previous crises and ensured the return to constitutional governance. ECOWAS has a strong commitment to democratic principles and has been actively involved in conflict resolution and mediation efforts in the region. The downfall of ECOWAS due to military coups is unlikely, as the organization has demonstrated resilience and the ability to adapt to challenges. However, the persistence of such groups could hinder the progress of regional integration and economic development, and ECOWAS will continue to play a crucial role in addressing these issues and maintaining stability in West Africa. Africa indeed plays a significant role in the clash of civilizations, geopolitics, geoeconomics, and the global landscape. The continent's history, diverse cultures, resources, and strategic location make it a crucial player in global affairs. Africa's history is marked by phases of pre-colonial, colonial, and post-colonial eras. The colonial period, particularly under the English and French dominions, shaped the continent's political and economic landscape. The legacies of colonization, including borders and governance structures, continue to influence contemporary African geopolitics. However, it is essential to recognize that Africa is not a homogenous entity. The continent comprises of 54 diverse states, each with its own unique history, culture, and political dynamics. This diversity presents both challenges and opportunities in terms of regional integration, cooperation, and conflict resolution. One potent force that has the potential to unite Africa is the philosophy of Ubuntu, which originated in the southern corner of the continent. Ubuntu emphasizes the interconnectedness of humanity and promotes values such as empathy, compassion, and communal harmony. Embracing Ubuntu can foster a sense of shared identity and common purpose, facilitating regional cooperation and integration. Africa's geographical isolation, surrounded by vast bodies of water, gives it a unique position on the global stage. This isolation, while presenting challenges to connectivity and trade, also offers opportunities for regional cooperation and self-determination. Efforts such as the African Union aim to promote unity, peace, and socioeconomic development across the continent. The future of Africa is indeed far from monolithic. The continent continues to navigate its post-colonial path as it takes on diverse states with various political systems, economic prospects, and continues to coexist with social dynamics. Africa's potential lies in harnessing its demographic dividends and rich natural resources promoting good governance, sustainable development, and inclusive growth. 
To fully realize its potential, Africa needs investment in infrastructure, education, healthcare, and technology. Addressing socioeconomic inequalities, promoting regional integration, and fostering a favorable business environment will be crucial. By leveraging its strengths and embracing the principles of Ubuntu, Africa can play a pivotal role in shaping the global landscape, not just within its borders, but also in international relations, trade, and cultural exchange. Mercosur and UNASUR are regional organizations in South America that aim to foster economic integration, political cooperation, and regional solidarity among their member states. Mercosur, M-E-R-C-O-S-U-R, which stands for the Southern Common Market, was established in 1991 by Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, and Uruguay. Its main purpose is to promote free trade, enhance economic cooperation, and harmonize policies among its member countries. Mercosur seeks to eliminate trade barriers, encourage investments, and create larger markets for its member states. UNASUR, U-N-A-S-U-R, the Union of South American Nations, was founded in 2008 with the goal of promoting regional integration and cooperation on various issues, including political dialogue, infrastructure development, social development, and defense. UNASUR comprises all 12 South American nations and aims to strengthen democracy, advance social inclusion, and address regional challenges collectively. The creation of Mercosur and UNASUR was driven by the need to strengthen South American countries' bargaining power in the global arena, promote economic development, and address common challenges such as inequality, poverty, and political instability. Both organizations have actively worked towards their objectives. Mercosur has implemented various trade agreements, established common external tariffs, and facilitated the movement of goods and services among its member states. UNASUR has focused on political dialogue, conflict resolution, and joint efforts in areas such as health, education, and infrastructure development. As for posing a threat to other superpowers, Mercosur and UNASUR are primarily regional organizations focused on regional integration and cooperation. While they aim to enhance the collective voices of South American countries, they do not pose a direct threat to other global superpowers. Instead, they seek to strengthen their own regional ties and promote South American interests. However, it is important to note that the success of regional organizations like Mercosur and UNASUR depends on the commitment and engagement of their member states. Internal political differences, economic challenges, or shifts in government priorities could potentially impact the effectiveness of these organizations. Additionally, changes in the global geopolitical landscape or shifting alliances could also influence their dynamics. Nonetheless, both Mercosur and UNASUR continue to work towards regional integration and cooperation, adapting to new challenges and opportunities as they arise. It is difficult to predict with certainty what political or geopolitical situations will occur in the future, such as those experienced in 2020. In 2020, the pandemic had a major impact on the global economy, leading to economic recession in many countries. In addition, political tensions between global superpowers increased, leading to a shift in the geopolitical landscape. These changes had a major impact on regional organizations such as Mercosur and UNASUR, as they had to adapt to the new realities and adjust the strategies accordingly. The world is constantly evolving, and new challenges and dynamics will emerge over time. However, it is plausible to expect that similar events or trends may occur in some form. So as for the emergence of civilizational regional systems like the Eurasian Union, Mercosur, UNASUR, and the African Union, it is possible that we may see more regional integration and cooperation in the future. Regional organizations often arise from a desire to enhance collective bargaining power, promote economic development, and address common challenges. 
These entities can shape the trajectory of the world by fostering regional stability, economic growth, and cooperation. However, it is important to note that the path towards a super civilization or a global system heavily influenced by regional entities is uncertain. The world is diverse with different cultures, interests, and geopolitical dynamics. To achieve a truly global system would require extensive cooperation, compromise, and coordination among nations and regions. While regional organizations can play a significant role in shaping the world, it is unlikely that their emergence alone will mark the culmination of history. History is a continuous process, and the trajectory of the world will be shaped by various factors, including technological investments, geopolitical shifts, and societal changes. It is crucial to approach the prospects of future developments with an open mind, recognizing that the future will be shaped by a complex interplay of multiple factors rather than a linear progression towards a predetermined outcome. As for the connection to the clash of civilizations theory, again, it is important to note that this theory suggests that future conflicts will primarily occur along cultural and civilizational fault lines. And while the Eurasian Union could potentially bring countries together with different cultural and civilizational backgrounds, it must be reminded that the establishment and objectives are driven more by geopolitical and economic considerations rather than by a direct manifestation of the clash of civilizations theory. The concept of a clash of civilizations is a complex and debated topic among scholars and experts. While it is difficult to predict with certainty whether a clash of civilizations will occur in the future, it is important to consider several factors. Firstly, it is crucial to recognize that civilizations are diverse and dynamic entities, and their interactions are influenced by a multitude of factors such as politics, economics, and social dynamics. The future trajectory of these interactions cannot be determined with certainty. Secondly, it is important to note that the world has witnessed periods of both cooperation and conflict between civilizations throughout history. While conflicts based on cultural or civilizational differences have occurred in the past, it is also noteworthy that cooperation and mutual understanding have been achieved in various instances. As for current indications or proof, it is challenging to provide a definitive answer. However, it is worth noting that in today's globalized world, interconnectivity, technological advancements, and increased people-to-people -people interactions have the potential to promote understanding and bridge cultural divides. If a clash of civilizations were to occur, it would be difficult to pinpoint a specific location. Conflicts can emerge in various regions due to a range of geopolitical, socio-cultural, or economic factors. It is wise to approach this topic with caution, as it is influenced by numerous complex and unpredictable variables. Ultimately, it is crucial for individuals, communities, and nations to foster dialogue, promote understanding, and work towards peaceful cooperation to mitigate the potential for conflicts based on cultural or civilizational differences. When it comes to individuals and communities preferring to stay within their ethnic, religious, cultural, or racial communities, it is critical to consider a range of factors that can influence such preferences. While there may be instances where people prioritize their own group, it is crucial to approach this topic with nuance and avoid generalizations. From a political standpoint, some individuals or groups may advocate for the preservation of their cultural or ethnic identity due to concerns about assimilation or the erosion of their heritage. This can be influenced by historical experiences, perceptions of discrimination, or a desire to maintain a sense of belonging and cultural continuity. Psychologically, people often feel a natural affinity for those who share similar backgrounds or experiences. This can lead to the formation of close-knit communities or the desire to live in areas where they feel a sense of familiarity and comfort. Additionally, individuals may also be influenced by societal and media narratives that reinforce cultural or ethnic identities. However, it is crucial to note that individuals and communities are not monolithic 
and preferences for integration or segregation can vary greatly. Many people actively seek integration, recognizing the benefits of diversity, multiculturalism, and the enrichment that can come from engaging with different cultures and perspectives. It is imperative to foster inclusive societies that value diversity, promote equal opportunities, and encourage dialogue between different groups. By promoting understanding, respecting individual choices, and addressing societal challenges, societies can work towards creating environments that embrace cultural preservation and integration. As we navigate this ever-evolving global landscape, it is crucial to maintain a nuanced perspective, recognizing the interplay of historical forces, geopolitical shifts, and the enduring human spirit. The tapestry of our world continues to unfurl, and our journey of understanding remains a constant endeavor. The issues brought up touch on some of the most critical aspects of our evolving landscape. The idea of achieving a unified humanity, transcending national boundaries, is indeed a noble aspiration, but it faces significant challenges from the persistence of various civilizations and the shifting dynamics of the state system. As mentioned, there can be an argument raised indicating that we can witness a transition towards a world of regions. This shift represents a new layer of complexity in global governance as regions assert themselves and develop their own identities and interests. These regions, like North America, the Caribbean, South America, and the Islamic region, stretching from North Africa to the Philippines, are becoming increasingly significant players on the world stage. Africa, in particular, is poised for greater prominence due to the rise of progressive leaders, partnerships with global powers like China, and its geostrategic importance. The African continent, with its diverse states and regions, may indeed become a central focus of global affairs. Furthermore, the penetration of Europe by Russia and China through initiatives like the Belt and Road Initiative is reshaping the geopolitical landscape. The development of transportation infrastructure that connects Beijing to Spain signifies a unification of continents and an exchange of goods, potentially leading to the emergence of a great Eurasian landmass. This shift has profound implications for global politics and economics. Regarding the media landscape, there is concern about the negative and polarizing effects of contemporary news. News has increasingly become a source of division, with outlets often promoting extreme viewpoints to capture audiences' attention. The issue of media propaganda is a complex one, with historical instances like the alleged funding of Reuters by British intelligence illustrating how media can be influenced by powerful threats. The challenge today is to navigate the media landscape critically and discerningly. It is important for individuals to seek out diverse sources of information, verify facts, and be aware of potential biases in reporting. Promoting media literacy and critical thinking is crucial to counter the negative effects of propaganda and polarization. Moreover, the idea of transcending traditional left-wing and right-wing divisions in media discourse is a valuable perspective. It encourages people to focus on the quality of information and its veracity rather than adhering to rigid ideological positions. In an era of increased polarization, finding common ground and fostering constructive dialogue becomes even more essential. In summary, the evolving world of regions and penetration of Europe by Russia and China and the challenges posed by contemporary media all require individuals and societies to adapt think critically, and engage with global affairs in a balanced and informed manner. Achieving a more unified and peaceful world necessitates open dialogue and a commitment to shared values and interests. As we bring this episode of the Diplomacy and Discourse podcast to a close, I want to convey my deepest appreciation for your viewership and listenership. If you found this discussion as enlightening and thought-provoking as we have, we humbly request your support. Please consider liking this video, subscribing to our channel, and leaving a review on your favorite podcast platform. Your active engagement and feedback are the pillars of our growth, allowing us to connect with a broader audience of curious minds. Should you have any questions, thoughts, or suggestions, do not hesitate to reach out 
to us at diplomacyanddiscourse at gmail.com. Your contributions shape the path we take. Once again, thank you for being an essential member of our community. Your support is treasured, and we anticipate more captivating conversations and episodes that inspire exploration. Until next time, take care and continue your journey into the intriguing world of diplomacy and discourse.